Wij openen academische zittingen met het uitspreken van het votum. Onze hulp is in de naam des heren die hemel en aarde gemaakt heeft. Gaat u zitten. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, distinguished guests, students. Let me wish you a very warm welcome to this festive celebration of our 138th birthday, our Dies Natalis. Let me especially welcome astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti, upon whom we will be conferring an honorary doctorate today, and our Dies speaker, our distinguished colleague, Pic Fossen. This academic year, we highlight the profile theme, Connected World which transcends disciplinary boundaries to connect researchers from multiple faculties across the campus. Two of our interfaculty institutes, CLU Plus and the Network Institute, are squarely positioned within this theme, studying culture, cognition, history, and heritage, and the interaction between dig digital technology and society, respectively. The theme for today's celebration is a giant leap in communication a somewhat tongue-in-cheek reference to Neil Armstrong's famous utterance, one giant leap for mankind. What does it mean to live in a connected world? The immediate association is with technology. Technology that makes our world smaller physically and virtually. Technology that makes it possible to almost instantaneously contact someone halfway around the world. Let me put it in perspective. Growing up in India, I remember having to make a long distance call, or trunk call as we called it, by calling an operator and waiting sometimes hours until a connection was established with the city that you desired to reach somebody in. Direct dial didn't exist and it cost a small fortune. Nowadays, I communicate with my mother in India or a scientific collaborator in Australia by video on my mobile phone at the touch of a button and at virtually no cost. If that isn't a giant leap in communication, I don't know what is. Technology has brought us closer. It has opened new opportunities to interact, collaborate, and learn from each other. Allowed us to keep abreast of world developments virtually in real time. And helped us to revisit, revitalize, and nurture old friendships. But there is a flip side to this giant leap. We're continuously online. If you know me, you can res res expect a response to an email fairly quickly. We're always reachable. We're but a phone call or an SMS or a WhatsApp message away. The phenomenon of social media allows us to share successes, missteps, trivialities, and rumors, and to propagate inaccurate or incomplete news in real time. And it has completely redefined the way we connect, communicate, and interact with each other. Peek is going to tell us a little bit about that. The world has become smaller indeed, but in many ways we've become lonelier, more insular, and more competitive. And we've unwittingly created a new, digitally driven, but very, very real pressure cooker. We see our students struggling with this pressure and our colleagues grappling with it. An increasingly connected world is, of course, not the sole source of pressure. For students, the introduction of loans instead of grants and the reality of juggling studies, jobs, and other activities contribute. University staff are confronted with budgets per student that are showing exactly one way, an inexorable decline, forcing them, forcing us, to do more for less. We are getting close to breaking point. It is no wonder then that academics are protesting, and academics are not usually the type who actually go out to protest with 
banners and other such uh, devices, but we are. Look back to last month's actions across most universities by VEO and AXI. This is an, a group, an organization of, of academics across all universities uh, in this country, and it is something that many of us have, uh, certainly we, uh, this executive board has supported, but I see Geert ten Dam also here, and she has also supported it, as have others across this, 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 this country. Let's bring it closer to home. What does it mean to live in a connected world for us at this university, at our university, at the Freie Universiteit? In her speech at the opening of the academic year, our president, Miriam van Praag, spoke of three directions that we will focus on as we strive to combine academic excellence with societal relevance. The university has a place to become someone, not something. That is, the university has an environment where you can develop yourself as an academic citizen, where you can broaden your mind and horizons, and not just be trained in a specific discipline or profession. The university has a bright and diverse community that is active and responsible. The university has a community that steps out of its own bubble because it is true, we very often create our own little bubble or big bubble around universities and into the world. All three ambitions have one thing in common. They require us, you, our students and staff, to make connections. It requires us to make conventional and unconventional links, to step outside disciplinary borders, to work together in diverse teams, to be inspired by each other's ideas and viewpoints, to engage in debate, sometimes sharp and heated, always respectful, to be inspired by a fellow voyagers, if you will, in our community and outside this community. But as I said last year, we also need a responsible and sustainable ecosystem with an investment in education that is commensurate with our collective ambitions. An investment that allows us to give our staff the breathing room to be able to devote their time to creative and high quality teaching and research, to pay full attention to helping our students and our university achieve our fullest potential to creating a vibrant academic community. This is a message that we will continue to champion within the university, in the corridors of political Den Haag, and in our coordinated actions with our sister universities in the Netherlands under our umbrella organization, the VSNU, or the VSNU in English and the VSNU in, uh, in Dutch. Now, on your seats, you, <coughs> you would have found a leaflet with, with information about the Vuvereniging. The Vuvereniging stands for safeguarding the extraordinary identity of our university and represents a broad network of alumni and friends. Once again, this too is a connected world. Please consider joining. There'll be people outside waiting to take uh, your forms from you. Ladies and gentlemen, our FU microcosm is a tightly knit community. Our compact campus lends itself to creating a very connected world where it is natural to reach across faculties and disciplines to collaborate. I'm delighted that our DS speaker, <clears throat> Professor of Computational Lexicology, Peek Fossen, will guide us through his research and how we are connected by culture, language, and communication. Peek is one of our top scientists, a Spinoza Prize winner, but also someone who has so successfully operated across the boundaries of disciplines. Peek combines his expertise in the humanities with the wonders of modern technology to understand the consequences of these developments for society and to understand how society adapts to deal with these developments. Among other things, Peek is working on getting robots to understand humans and not just the technical interpretation of the words that we speak, but the subtlest nuances, the context of our speech. Peak is connecting, if you will, humans and machines. And it doesn't really get very much more connected than that, ladies and gentlemen. Peak, may I invite you to the podium?
Good afternoon, everybody. And um, um, I feel honored to, to stand here and present this lecture. And I want to connect first to this title, A Giant Leap in Communication. And there is already kind of a universe uh, shown here in this picture. Um, it's a fascinating universe of the internet, a kind of a universe of humanity displayed here. And I, I mean, I'm really fascinated. I want to know what it is, what happens there. And I hope you too. So let's have a look, because you can actually look at the internet live. If the, uh, the technical staff wants to help me and switch to my laptop, we're going to peek into this internet. So this is a website where they show live statistics of the internet. And that's really amazing. I mean, it's like if half of the population in the world is an internet user. Um, this is the number of emails sent today, and it's excluding you not emailing now, otherwise it probably would have doubled or something. <laughs> and this is the number of websites that is actually currently uh, uh, accessible, number of tweets, and you can go to, uh, this is what is going on in a year. Um, so these are amazing numbers, and there is an amazing activity. It's almost as if we, this is the only thing we do, is communicating over the internet. So if you please can go back to the presentation. Thank you. So actually, if you look at these numbers, you wonder, sorry, I went one too far. Yeah. I mean, people think there is knowledge and information on the internet, and we live in an inter information society. But I think we live in a communication society. In a few days, weeks, maybe a month, we will communicate more data than there is directly accessible. And if you think of websites being curated data that people thought about and published at some times, uh, at some moment in time, uh, deliberately, then this communication is maybe something that they haven't thought about very uh, long, and they exchange it over and over again. So the f total volume of information on the web is being moved around over the world. And so this makes you think about um, what happens there, what knowledge is being exchanged between these people over and over again. What is the implication of that? So uh, will this change our mind? Will this change what we believe to be true? Maybe we wake up one day and suddenly the majority of people believe that the earth is flat again and there's nothing we can do about it. So this whole idea about the information society, this enlightened idea that you have free access to knowledge, information, facts, databases, that it is inclusive, everybody can access this information, that it could be liberating, it also has a, a, a dark side. Eh? There is the deception, free access to all kinds of unsupported claims, lies, errors, deception, inconsistencies, um, uh, misquotes or twisting of the truth. So, it is time for a quiz. We'll make this a little bit more interactive. I would like to invite you to go to this website, uh, menti.com, and you're allowed to use your phone for, as an exception, and enter this code here, uh, which will give you access to a quiz. And in this quiz, I want to um, test um, you as a, a critical and academic audience um, to see how well you can judge information that is posted every day on the internet as being reliable, uh, possible, or true, or that you think, no, this is complete nonsense, I would never believe such a statement. And we start with practicing. Here's a very simple one. And if you manage to enter the code in this website, you will see this in, on the phone with a little bit more information. This is a claim that was posted in the news and copied on social media, on Facebook, by, uh, but also by serious journals and, and newspapers that uh, symptoms of hay fever um, um, can be suppressed by drinking gin tonic. So, my question to you, and apparently about 100 people now have voted, do you believe this or don't you believe that? 
at some point we should stop. Um, so if you really want to vote, then do it now. Well, it's still growing. Okay, slowing down. Let's see. Ah, right. So, 132 people think this is not true and 60 people think this is true. Fine, great. I'm not going to say if it is true or not true, I will say this later on. Let's go to another claim. This one, it's also about hay fever. It was also posted on social media and in the news. Um, so again, do you believe this is true or not true? If you would read this or hear about that or see it on Facebook. So I guess there are about uh, 150 people here actively voting, so actually, ah, more people manage to get online, I guess. It goes way faster. It could be that there are people looking at this live and from home also vote, so it's not maybe everybody in the audience. Okay, it's slowing down, so let's see. Ah, more people, I think it's all, ah, oh, it's a little bit the same, is it? More people voted. Uh, Slightly more, but the, the, the distribution is almost the same. So I got these two uh, statements from uh, um, the uh, uh, website, which is shown here, uh, newscheckers.nl, and that is a group that uh, picks up uh, uh, these claims from uh, social media news and then tries to validate them. So nobody knows really if they are correct or not correct, but according to them, the story about gin tonic is not true. There is no evidence for that, so you can continue to drink your beer. Uh, but this one, there is evidence. There is really a Japanese uh, research, only one, um, that uh, found evidence for this. Uh, the only problem is that you have to kiss for half an hour before <laughs> it is effective. So, okay, this was just to, 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 to train you in using this, uh, 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 this uh, uh, a Mentimeter application. So now let's go to something more serious. We go to a uh, statement about uh, biomedical, uh, uh, biomedical statements. And again, I ask you not if you know if that is the case, but would you believe a statement like that? Or do you think it is something that is, uh, could be true? Or you think, no, that's really impossible. So don't think too long. Um, these statements are actually not so I have to be careful because I'm using the wrong clicker. So this is a little bit more uh, technical. And maybe some, there are some experts here in the, in the, in the room, but uh, I guess most people are not an expert on this topic. So please read it and just vote. So apparently people need a little bit more time to think about it, but we're getting close to 200. Okay, give you a few seconds more. Okay, let's stop this. All right, so apparently majority of the audience <laughs> believes this to be true and a minority thinks it's false. All right, let's go on. Another one, kind of similar statement. So mercury, aluminium are neurotoxic uh, substances and they result in a rapid reduction of zinc levels, disruption of gene expressions, and that has all kinds of consequences, such as disorders of the limbic system in the brain up to uh, uh, paralysis. And how far are we? 120, 30, 130? Okay. Let's stop about here, 200. Ah, so there is a majority that believes that this is true, um, but not as distinctive as last time. Actually, you could see I'm switching true and fake in, the or in, in order because uh, that's a science, of course, that you shouldn't have the same answer in the same order. Um, let's go on. So this is another one, and I'm gonna speed up a little bit 
So aluminium hydroxide in vaccines leads to depletion of calcium, phosphorus and vitamin D needed by children to grow and develop their immune system. So people, please vote. Would you believe this statement if you would read it on the web, in, on Facebook or in the news, or wouldn't you believe it? Okay, we'll stop if we reach 200, I guess. Oh, we go on, but that probably doesn't change anything. Ah, suddenly there is a majority for fake. Great. You are a fantastic audience. You behave exactly as I want you to behave. <laughs> Here's another one. So please vote. Do it quickly, because we want to know actually what's going on here. Okay, again, majority fake. That is interesting. Okay, then we have another one. Please vote. And maybe you are starting to see the pattern here. Okay, let's stop here. So again, by far a majority you think it's fake. Uh, well, this one, I guess, I don't need, even need to ask you. Oh, I thought I excluded that one. Uh, my prediction is that the majority will think this is fake. <laughs> now don't behave differently than you would have, of course. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's the same thing. How oh, you see, I'm right. And then, I mean, if anybody here would think that this is true, well, that's only the people who think this is true vote. <laughs> okay, let's stop her here. Eh, yeah. Okay, uh, final one, because the, the statements get more wild, uh, more and more wild, of course. So. And I would be surprised if there would be anybody believing this. But. Okay, well, still 11 people. Okay, well, thank you very much because you, 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 you really, can we switch back to the PowerPoint, please? I hope I, yes, there we are. Thank you very much. I mean, you exactly showed my point. So after the, the hay fever examples, there were three examples with statements about uh, uh, um, effects, uh, negative effects as a result of substances like mercury and uh, uh, aluminium uh, uh, hydroxide. And there was the majority of you actually thought that is kind of plausible, possible, and you voted for true. Then there were three, uh, uh, five statements in which the word vaccine was mentioned. And actually all of these statements are statements from people who are against vaccination. They used the first one to motivate, the first three to motivate the last five. And apparently you switched immediately from believing it to not believing just because the word vaccine was mentioned there. So, I think there are two important points here. First of all, it is not easy, not even for an academic uh, critical crowd, to judge whether something is true or not true if it comes to these very technical bio, biomedical claims. And a second point, I think, is that your probably a biased position with respect to vaccination, which I, I kind of anticipated, um, makes you consider something to be more or less true. 
uh, because the rationale of these anti-vaxxers is that exactly the substances that you believe to cause these effects are included in the vaccines and therefore cause all the other properties, except the Bill Gates one and the, uh, the, the, the monkey uh, uh, virus. But so you can imagine that if you as a critical and trained audience that can reason logically, I assume, and, and read very critically, have difficulty doing that, what will happen to uh, people who are not trained to do that? So this is really what we want to know. We want to know how the internet as a medium influences people or how people deal with, deal with information they get from this medium and what this medium, how it actually works and operates. And for that, we're going to look at a societal debate about vaccination. Um, of course, the, the examples were already hinting to that, and this is actually a very nice use case. Not only because there is a, a big societal, uh, it's a very important topic, there is a, this societal relevance, but also because you can measure the impact of the communication directly by the coverage of the vaccination. Uh, the other thing which I, us is made, makes it very interesting is the, that there are, very, uh, there are many different stakeholders. You have the pharmaceutical industry, you have uh, the uh, scientific community, the government, but also grassroots movements, uh, religious movements, and you have or groups, and you have the parents who want they do, that have to take a decision. So that's a very interesting uh, 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 diversity of stakeholders. Um, the other thing that we really like about that is that the actual debate, let's say, the, 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 the uh, logical reasoning is kind of uh, uh, overseeable. Uh, it's not a very complex debate because it's about the good or bad effects of vaccinating people. Um, so this is overseeable. So you can actually get a good picture of the argumentations and the reasoning that people use in relation to this. If you would do this for climate change or for uh, the European Union or for migration, then these topics are too complex for us to really measure what is going on with the knowledge that people acquire through this medium. Okay, so, um, but the first question that we really want to answer is, is there a debate going on? Is the internet as a digital medium actually representing a debate? And I don't think that it is a debate. And let's look at a few very concrete examples of websites and information that you can find on the web. And I collected this a couple of years ago. Um, and the first one is from this website here. Oops, sorry. Ah, the thing is too slow. Uh, vaccine Impact. It's a website from people who are against vaccination. And um, there is this uh, image here up there that summarizes a very strong statement. Uh, they claim that there are zero, that zero people died from measles and 108 people died from measles vaccination. So the text itself is kind of uh, uh, explaining this statement. And I colored uh, elements in the text um, that uh, uh, indicate, point to the source of information, the authority, the actual statement, and to what kind of time period the statement relates. So, for instance, this information is coming from this uh, Health Impact News Editor. I didn't know that something like that exists, but it's there. It's uh, Brian uh, Shilhavi, and he is quoting um, somebody else. Uh, this Dr. Anne Schuchet, and she is the director of the CDC, which is the American equivalent of the RIVM in the Netherlands, um, as a authority. So she, she's not only the primary source, but also an authority, because she's a doctor and a director of an official government institute, um, as being the one that claims this statement. And for transparency, he's also pointing to the trace of the information coming from Fox News and originally from the Associated Press. If you would go to the original article in the Associated Press, which probably nobody does, then you can read there that she is making this statement in the context of a story where she says that due to a successful vaccination program in the US, there have been no measles deaths. So this is completely taken out of context. 
And actually, she's warning that there are signs that the vaccination uh, the, uh, coverage is going down. And she says, it's just, we have, just have to wait for the f first people to die of measles in the United States. So she's making exactly the opposite statement. Now, the other th interesting point, the second one, that there are 108 people died from the measles vaccinations, is something that they get from a, uh, a database, which is called uh, uh, VARS, which is a government database, so it's an official source. It has authority because the government decided to set up the database. And um, there they found that there are 108, and this is a database where people can report adverse events in relation to vaccination. So there's a vaccination, you get sick or something else happened, and you can report there, and anybody can do that. And there they found 108 people that died over the same period of 10 years uh, due to uh, resulting from f four different measles vaccin vaccines that were sold in the United States. Now, let's go to another site, an official government site, this one, the National Vaccine Information Center. Um, they are, of course, supporting vaccination. Um, here you find a page answering, giving you information about this question, question here, can measles vaccine cause injury and death? What do they do? Well, they list uh, the common side effects. It goes from reddening, swelling, itching, and more serious ones, which are rare, uh, diabetes, uh, uh, brain inflammation, uh, 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 bronchial spasms, etc. cetera. Um, and then in this uh, 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 expanded box, they point to the same database as the other people pointed to, they say that in this virus database, there are 7,692 serious adverse events reported in relation to measles vaccine since 1990, and 397 people died. Of these events, we're reporting about people that died. So what is going on here? Um, so this is a site which has, it takes a different position. Um, they don't explain where, they don't really state that these people died because of the vaccination. They don't say um, how many people didn't die because of vaccination in that period. Um, they don't say how many peop or people or children died while they were not vaccinated. So there is no, no, no uh, um, explanation in terms of statistical significance or uh, correlation or any other explanation that there is a relation between vaccination and people dying. This is a strange thing. So anybody who finds this can take this and use it for any purpose in reasoning or arguing about your position with respect to this discussion. But they are not discussing, they are not addressing or, or connecting the information they have to the other side where they claim the opposite explicitly uh, using the same data. So what happens here, I think, is that people post information, but they don't listen to each other. So they, uh, they don't reach each other, and they don't link to each other. So they're not connected. Now try, let's look at uh, our RIVM, uh, the, the Dutch uh, uh, Institute for Health. Um, and uh, I, I translated the uh, most important parts uh, in English, uh, in these red boxes, and they have a very different approach. So they try to communicate. They uh, try to uh, write or provide this information uh, having the anti-vaxxer in mind. So they are very careful by saying that there is a lot of information and uh, that uh, sometimes it provides clarity and other people uh, 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 get maybe confused or uh, it raises questions. Um, so, so kind of open to all kinds of uh, positions. And then down here, they quote a argument from an anti-vaccination -vac person um, that uh, measles is a child disease and therefore not serious. And how do they treat that? Well, first they say, this is an opinion. And by that, they kind of disqualify the statement. And then they say, but measles can uh, be, uh, can have very serious complications and uh, actually children die because of these, compli uh, these complications. So they try to enter into the debate 
But again, this might not work either because who is listening? Who can guarantee me that the people are actually accessing this information? And secondly, it doesn't really necessarily mean that they're open to the argumentation that they provide here because they just gave plain facts on their own authority. So there's no, no really uh, uh, an incentive for them to believe that what they say is true. So the point I want to make is that this internet, this fantastic medium, is not representing a debate at all. Uh, it's something else. So it's a kind of a posting, uh, which is very fast, easy and efficient. Uh, we, we have seen that. But it also has sex appeal, because it appeals to our vanity, because we can have an impact on the world. Uh, it gives you power. You have a, potentially the whole world as an audience. And if the people with the same ideas respond to you, you also feel accepted. So that is a, gives you a good feeling using this medium. It's disconnected, as we have seen. People don't link to each other. Uh, in terms of information. It's very heterogeneous. You have very different types of platforms from social media, official government sites, to blogs, to groups that particularly look for scientific uh, evidence but are not scientists. Um, it's also asynchronized in the sense that people just post things at different moments and times, whenever they like, uh, and not specifically time this in relation to a linear debate that like progresses in time. And it is dispersed, eh? it happens everywhere. So somebody can post something there, somebody can maybe attack that post, but then the same claim can pop up somewhere else and this happens every, everywhere. So you cannot even fight what is going on, you cannot control it. And the important thing I think is there is no what I call propositional alignment. By that I mean that in a debate, debaters specifically address the claim of somebody else and then relate their claim to that claim. But in this case, nobody knows what the total amount of claims is. In order to do that, you need to read that massive amount of communication, all of it, continuously, but also memorize what has been said. And people can't do that. Uh, and then you find all kinds of different styles of convincing you about uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this discussion uh, from reasoning, people provide real evidence, association, it's just social identity that plays a role, uh, they make all kinds of uh, unsupported claims, authorization, pointing to authorities is important, sometimes it's plain emotions, conspiracy theory, and some people just try, and try to make money out of this discussion. So, I mean, it's not amazing that people are really, really, really puzzled by this. If you go to the internet as a parent and you want to make a decision, you, you never know where you end up. And you have, never know to what kind of uh, information um, <coughs> you uh, are, uh, um, um, or get access to. So, what is our answer to this, this situation? Uh, well, our answer is what we call the perspective of web, and this is a concept, an idea that we are working on with several researchers at the VU and, and the UFA. And in this perspective web, we want to provide more transparency uh, to the knowledge and information. We also want to give people an overview of, of everything that is out there, and we hope that they can have more insight in this discussion and debate, which you will not get if you just access the internet the way people do now. And this perspective web, we want to build this through software. This software is what we call a reading machine that can read as, as much information as you want. It can scrape the whole web if necessary. It can extract the propositions, the claims from every uh, uh, post. It can find out who made this claim, but also find out what is the perspective of the source with respect to the claim. Uh, is somebody believing it or denying it? Is somebody certain, uncertain? Uh, is, uh, maybe the source has a particular emotion or maybe the source has a, a particular intention with uh, uh, providing this information. And the way that works um, is shown in this uh, slightly animated uh, 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 um, series of slides where this here, could represent um, the internet as it is now, 
where you have uh, a, a scattered um, uh, collection of posts where maybe somebody posts, posts or retreats information of somebody else and in each of them you find pieces of text, sometimes weird one like this one, this uh, looks like a Trump tweet, kid got shot, next thing autism, or uh, this one, swellings, redness after injection, injection of what, I mean you have to be able to understand that, never showed any correlations or whatever. So the first thing that this software needs to do, and that is a big challenge, is to try to read these sentences and turn them into uh, 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 claims, or we call these micro propositions, that we can actually compare across all these posts. So that would mean it translates that blurry text, these words, into something very simple, which is a, 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 a triple relation where vaccines cause autism or vaccines cause swelling or any kind of other statement. If we normalize the language to these propositions, the next thing we can do with the software easily is rearrange it in such a way that we order the internet by propositions. So we have now only two propositions which we mined from the web and we have a whole bunch of sources that actually where you can find the same propositions being represented. And after you've done that, the software tries to look, and you remember I marked some of the text as uh, red being the sources, blue being the authority, and, uh, and uh, green being the statement. So the software also tries to detect these sources. Uh, not only who are the sources or what kind of sources are connected to these propositions, but also what is the perspective? Were they certain? Did they raise doubt about it? Were they denying it? Why are they actually stakeholders? So they're selling pills or they want to, to, to vaccinate their children? Um, and do they express any emotions? So this is what we call a perspective web. And since it is software, it can do this for a massive amount of data and it can do this again and again and again. And then we get a kind of a graph where we could also study dynamics. So are these, are these perspectives changing over time? Are there new claims coming up or are claims disappearing over time? Or do they spread over regions or social groups? So this is the ideal that we, we are working to, of course. There is software, it's not good enough, but we hope with research to improve it. And then uh, hopefully somebody will turn this into an app or a tool that people can actually use. Now, with this, you can also get overview of all the claims. So we are currently building up a data set of, uh, based on 300 uh, uh, posts that we uh, scraped from the internet. Um, these are English posts <coughs> at the moment. And uh, these documents have been processed already by the software. Uh, students are currently uh, annotating all these posts in terms of the claims and the sources and the perspectives and we hope to train the software to be able to do this as good as the students did. And this is what comes out of it now. So from these 300 posts, uh, these are the things that vaccines cause. Death, harm, side effects, and these statements are made by a lot of different people. They also prevent things, diseases, rabies, measles, six million deaths worldwide. They protect and save babies, immature immune systems, people, children, our lives, they protect you, and they contain all kinds of substances from mercury, nickel, agents, preservatives, uh, adjuvants, and genes. So, we can also create a kind of a, a, a graph of all the sources of the information. And that already is very interesting because uh, this actually a graph I created manually when I started uh, looking at this, and then I was looking at Dutch, websites uh, um, um, on the vaccination debate. Um, and what you notice very quickly is that there is a very small group of very active people who are against vaccination. Um, but if you look at to which websites they point as the sources for the evidence of the information, they all point to one website, this one. Want to know which points to this person and he points to this American website where you find all the evidence about uh, the bad effects of vaccination. 
Another interesting one is this here, this site, which is the website of a homeopathic uh, uh, doctor who has a cure against the side effect of vaccination, which is used by other people that since this cure removes the side effects, that is the explanation that the vaccination causes these side effects, which is a weird type of logic, but that is the way they are reasoning. So this is interesting because you can actually see the whole, uh, not the, 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 the um, this is kind of the internet as a hub structure where they get their evidence and information from. And you can also see that the official government sites like the RIVM and apotheek.nl, nobody connects to them and they don't connect to the rest. So they don't take part in this discussion or debate, which is not a debate actually. Okay, so interesting, two weeks ago, there was uh, uh, the campaign against the meningitis in the Netherlands and about 85% of the people uh, decided, from the target group, decided to, to vaccinate, which is a, a kind of a good success because the HPV campaign from, uh, what is it, four years ago, was a failure where only 65% of the target group uh, vaccinated and it actually went down over time to currently it's something like 53% of the target group that is uh, vaccinating. Um, and here are some quotes from the uh, Volkskrant um, uh, who interviewed people who decided to go there and vaccinate. And you can see here that suddenly, wow, they trust the RIVM and these people studied on this topic and they know a lot about it. So this is based not on logic, it's based on authority, but it comes from fear, I would say. So apparently we cannot convince these people and somebody from RIVM actually told me that, the only, that they, they think the only thing that will work is if there is a disaster, and then suddenly people will vaccinate. And this is what is going to happen here. Uh, this is uh, apparently co um, what, not going to happen, but um, what you, this quote hints at. And this is another one, it's kind of funny. Uh, this guy, this father, Ramon Patlou, it's also a quote from the Volkskrant, um, he thinks it is not necessary really to, to vaccinate his child. He says, well, people are just scared. There's only a few people, few young, few young people that really got sick. And it's the same as with the uh, swine flu and, and these measures are way too drastic. And he's, the only reason why he's vaccinating his child is because his wife told him to do it. And she said, well, you never know. Uh, but he believes personally the immune system needs to have the opportunity to build something up and everything is too clean. So he is not convinced by the logic. He's not open to the logic. So the important thing I think is that people don't fit their perspective to the logic. They fit the logic to their perspective. And are we then better as scientists? I don't really think so. So why are we scientists? What is our motivation there? It's also maybe vanity. Um, and, uh, for instance, the way pe scientists publish their work looks a lot like uh, this dispersed internet. I looked on Google Scholar for uh, this citation to the best of our knowledge, and uh, also the other one, as far as we know, and I got, uh, uh, um, uh, I think, about uh, one and a half million hits. And these people that put that sentence in their article kind of acknowledge that it is impossible for them to really know if their work is unique and nobody else did it in the world. They admit this by citing it like that. That's the only way they can actually protect themselves uh, uh, by, uh, against reviewers who say, well, your work is not unique. Um, to the best of our knowledge. So, who cites who and who reads what article. That looks a lot like that uh, internet. And then the other uh, uh, aspect is um, how fair and honest are we in our communication about our results. Um, there is a very interesting uh, paper by uh, Terit and colleagues from the uh, University of Amsterdam, All That Glitters Isn't Gold. And they looked at uh, 300 medical articles and in the medical articles are uh, uh, obliged to report a limitation of the result. So this is a kind of a formal thing that you have to do. 
And uh, they then looked at uh, 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 the hatching constructions in the article. Because if there is a limitation, you would expect that in the article, the scientists would kind of uh, uh, limit the, the, the strengths of the claims they make. Eh? And hatching, this is a conclusion from their, art, uh, this is a part of the conclusions of their article. Um, and you see the red words, uh, probable, very, may. These are typically hatching words. And there's software available, you can use it, then run it over as many PubMed uh, publications as you want, and you can just count the extent to which people use these words in uh, whatever part of the article you want to uh, analyze. And uh, so, as the conclusions say, um, that uh, 183 of the 219 articles that actually reported the limitation, they didn't temper their conclusions, which they could measure by the lack of hatching constructions. So they proposed this as if it is really, uh, 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 um, that there is evidence for this claim and there is no doubt about it, but in the limitations it, it, it appears that there is actually reason to, to uh, doubt the conclusions. So what does that mean? I mean, yeah. We as scientists, we could, you could see us as maybe the shepherds of truth. That is our core business. That is what we are supposed to do. We are, we, but we also always have to doubt any truth that we discover. We cannot just uh, be happy and stop working. We have to be critical. Um, so how does this work? How can we as scientists enter into a debate or uh, something, this, this posting, um, medium, which is not really a debate, uh, nobody will ever listen to us. They will not listen to our logic. They will not accept what we are saying. Um, but if we uh, do uh, this, uh, bring out our arguments, then how transparent should we be? Should we really be really true, truly open and, and transparent about all the errors, about all the failed research, about the, the, the things we cannot replicate, about the fraud. Um, well, if you're not transparent, they will not accept this. And if you are transparent, they will maybe also not accept this. So this is a very difficult position for us to, uh, uh, to reinvent our role um, with respect to society in relation to this medium. Okay, so I think I'm at the end of my talk. Uh, building the perspective web. Um, we do this now at the VU and the UVA uh, through two projects and there are a lot of people working on this, students, researchers, and we have a, a number of uh, uh, supervisors uh, running these projects. Uh, maybe the perspective web will work. Uh, maybe it will not work because if we supply people with these perspective graphs, that doesn't really mean that they will change their mind. Because as I said, they will not adapt the perspective to the logic, they will adapt the logic to the perspective. But at least I think we will be able to monitor or analyze what is going on and hopefully maybe come up with better ideas or solutions. Thank you very much. That was the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Peek, for this fascinating sort of look into the world of how uh, we deal with perspectives and analyze perspectives. Uh, I do have a response to your, uh, the question that you posed. Should we be trustworthy uh, and transparent? The answer is absolutely yes. Uh, and no matter what, that is our role as scientists, to go out there and present everything the truth, nothing but the truth, and all the things that also went wrong, because that is our responsibility. Thank you for this. And you know, the other thing that I really liked about this is you, you, you look at something that is so, so technologically advanced, but there's so many people from the humanities who've been working on it. Yeah? 
Lorenz Bot, I see, I see. Uh, Inger Lehmann, yourself, of course. Uh, and, and this is the sort of thing that, that, that really sort of plays up the, the power of, of, of working on the, on, the, on, the, on the borders, the boundaries of these disciplines. And you saw another connection out there, the FU and the UVA. That doesn't happen all the time, but here it is. Ladies and gentlemen, we now have a little intermezzo. And it is not a musical intermezzo as such, it is a dance performance. And it is a dance performance by the Syrian dancer Ahmad Jude. In the midst of the rubble and destruction of the war in Syria, Ahmad gave dance lessons to children orphaned by the war at the SOS villages in and around Damascus. And in the summer of 2016, the TV program News Ur made a documentary film about Ahmad entitled Dance or Die. After seeing this film, the Dutch National Ballet succeeded in bringing Ahmad to the Netherlands to continue his studies and career here. The Dance for Peace Fund was founded in order to support Ahmed in his living and study costs and to help him realize his lifelong ambition to dance. The fund will also be used in the future to facilitate other young talented dancers who find themselves in similar situations. Ladies and gentlemen, I present you Ahmed Jude.
Ladies and gentlemen, that was Ahmed Joudet. I am speechless. I will now try to find some speech. <laughs> this is also the view, ladies and gentlemen, that we pay attention to this, that we actually stop and 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 uh, you can see I'm a little bit emotional. though okay but the future is the kids yeah, and, and 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 I'm glad that 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 we have the privilege to live in a country where we have we can we have the freedom to to express ourselves and uh, to actually be able to uh, to engage in the debate that we were just speaking about. That is not always a given. I had the privilege of speaking to this young man just before this uh, event here. If you have a chance, talk to him. He has a price on his head, even in Amsterdam. Ladies and gentlemen, on to a a more festive note. We will now start with the conferral of the honorary doctorate of the Freie Universiteit Amsterdam on Ms. Samantha Cristoforetti. I would like to invite Samantha Cristoforetti and Professors Paola Gori Giorgi and Davide Iannuzzi, who have been appointed honorary supervisors by the College of Deans, to follow the Beadle to the podium. May I also invite Professor Hu Schreiber, Dean of the Faculty of Science, to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, the Italian astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti is being awarded an honorary doctorate in sciences for her contributions to the advancement of science, particularly the important experiments conducted during her stay at the International Space Station, for her dissemination activities on the relevance of fundamental and applied research, and for her role as an outstanding example of perseverance, determination, and passion for science and technology. The investiture will now be conferred by Professor Dav Davide Iannuzzi and Professor Paola Gori Giorgi, who have been appointed honorary supervisors by the College of Deeds. Professor Schreiber will arrange the kappa. May I ask the College of Deeds to rise, please? By virtue of the authority vested in me by the regulations of the Freie Universität Amsterdam and as a honorary supervisor appointed thereto by the College of Deans, I hereby confer on you, Samantha Cristoforetti, the degree Doctor Honoris Causa, together with all rights, privileges, and responsibilities thereto appertaining. In witness thereof, the grand seal of the university and signatures of the rector, the secretary of the College of Deans, and the honorary supervisor have been affixed to the diploma you're about to receive.
Paula, you may speak out the loud at you. Um, <clears throat> highly esteemed audience, it is a great honor for us today to present ESA astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti with an honorary doctorate in science. Samantha Cristoforetti's career is a wonderful combination of scientific, technological, and educational achievements. And she is, in many ways, a living example of the innate aspiration of humankind to constantly discover new frontiers. Cristoforetti received a master's degree in mechanical engineering in 2001 from the Technical University in Munich, where she specialized in aerospace propulsion and lightweight structures. During her studies, she also worked at the École Nationale Supérieure de l'Aeronautique et de l'Espace in Toulouse, where she performed a series of experiments in aerodynamics and at the Mendeleev University of Chemical Technologies in Moscow, where she worked on solid rocket propellants. She then attended the Italian Air Force Academy, where she was selected as class leader and bestowed with the Honors Award for her outstanding academic achievement. She served in the Italian Air Force as a jet pilot, logging more than 500 hours of flight distributed over six types of aircraft. In 2009, Cristoforetti was selected as an ESA astronaut, and upon completion of her basic training, she was assigned to the crew of Expedition 4243 on the International Space Station, the eighth long duration flight for an ESA astronaut. The flight with the, no, and the second, sorry, and the second long duration flight opportunity of the Italian Space Agency. The flight with the associated scientific program was known as the Futura mission. On November 23rd, 2014, Cristoforetti was launched from the Cosmodrome of Baikonur in Kazakhstan on board of a Russian Soyuz spacecraft. During her work on the space station, she performed dozens of experiments on behalf of the international microgravity research community, both in the physical sciences as well as life sciences and medical fields. On June 11, 2015, Cristoforetti ended her mission on the space station after 200 days in space, setting a new record for the longest single flight by a woman in space and the current record for the longest single flight by a European astronaut. After the successful completion of the Futura mission, Cristoforetti took charge of ESA spaceship EAC initiative a team of students and young graduates investigating innovating ideas for space exploration beyond low Earth orbit. Currently, she is crew representative for ESA in the Lunar Orbital Platform Project and part of a task force for the cooperation between ESA and the Chinese counterparts. Besides her crucial role in several experiments in space, Cristoforetti has been, and still is, very active in educational and outreach initiatives. During her flight mission, she continuously updated a public logbook describing her work and her experience in space. She gave a fundamental contribution to the Food from Spirulina project that ESA designed to teach high school students the process of photosynthesis, answering questions during an in-flight call. She also contributed to Mission X, Trying Like an Astronaut project, an educational program that challenged twins to emulate the lifestyle of astronauts with regular exercises and healthy nutrition. Back from her space mission, she has been participating to countless public events and has been eagerly contributing to scientific and technological outreach activities via, among others, her Twitter account, which counts nearly one million followers. Samantha Cristoforetti is in several ways the perfect candidate to receive an honorary doctorate 
from our university. She has conducted important experiments in research areas that our university promotes as most relevant, including life sciences for human health and sciences for sustainability. She has been very successful in communicating the beauty of nature and the fascination for science and technology to young people all around the world, highlighting the societal relevance of fundamental and applied research. She's a role model for any person who believes that with determination and hard work, it is possible to reach very ambitious results and to give long-lasting contribution in sciences and in the life of others. She's a citizen of the world who incarnates the dream of millions of children of all nations, religions, and genders. At a moment where the world seems to be increasingly beset by polarization and insularity, her unconditional dedication to large international space missions reinforces a basic concept that some people seem not to appreciate anymore, that humankind has unlimited possibilities when we unite efforts to go beyond physical, political, and social borders. Dr. Cristoforetti, on behalf of the College of Deans, the Executive Board, and the entire academic community of our university, I congratulate you upon your honorary degree. We are proud to add your name to our gallery of honorary doctors. And with a little coaching from my friends here, congratulazioni e benvenuta nella nostra comunità. We will now take a couple of photos. Dr. Christopher Etty, may I now uh, invite you to uh, address the audience. Thank you so much, Mr. Rector. Thank you, Madam President of the University. Thank you so much, Professor Iannuzzi, Professor Gore Giorgi. I am, uh, uh, I guess it's been said already, but I'm a, bit, a little bit speechless myself. This is uh, an amazing honor. Uh, I was uh, quite astonished when it was offered to me. Um, of course, a, an honorary doctorate is uh, equivalent to a very high level of uh, academic achievement. Um, I was even more astonished when I was told today that uh, previous uh, honorary, honorary doctorates were awarded to personalities like uh, Tim Berners-Lee or, or even Dr. Martin Luther King. So it's, uh, it's quite amazing to be part of, uh, of this group of, uh, of people. But I'm also very honored to be uh, awarded such an honor from uh, uh, such a prestigious uh, university. Um, I, um, I had the pleasure of uh, sharing a dinner yesterday with uh, with the rector and Professor Iannuzzi and Professor Gore Giorgi and, uh, and learning um, a bit more about uh, your university, something that astonished me uh, or impressed me is uh, the diversity of, uh, of, your, uh, of your student body, which is uh, it's really amazing because I think uh, students deserve a chance to, to learn and grow into, uh, you know, into uh, men and women who have that experience of, uh, of living and performing and thriving in, uh, in, uh, in a diverse uh, community. Uh, but also I really, um, uh, appreciate how your uh, university really strives to produce excellent research, excellent science, uh, excellent technological achievements by really 
tearing down the borders between disciplines and, and making sure that people collaborate across uh, disciplines. And today we had uh, an amazing example with the um, very, very interesting lecture that, uh, that was given. So I think that's, I think that's really important. I, I think we really need to do that if we want to, uh, to be able to tackle and, and solve the challenges that we are going to face more and more as, uh, as human beings on, uh, on this planet. And of course, you also uh, put a great focus on, uh, on sustainability, and uh, that's something that uh, I also very much uh, relate to. Um, that's something we also try to do uh, at the European Space Agency. Um, and of course, I very much recognize that uh, this uh, honor that was bestowed upon me today is very much due to the amazing opportunity and uh, the fortunate circumstances that allowed me to become an astronaut with the, with the European Space Agency. Um, we also strive to, uh, to, to produce uh, um, science and technology that uh, is of service, of use to, to the citizens in, in Europe and, and in the world. Some examples are obvious, you know, navigation systems, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Galileo constellation, uh, telecommunication technology, which allows us to be such a, a connected world with all the advantages, but also, of course, the, the new challenges that that entails. Uh, Earth observation, you know, we talked about sustainability, uh, the issues related to global warming, the issues related to uh, simply feeding a growing population on, uh, on the planet, and uh, you need data to tackle that challenge. And uh, one of the main sources of, uh, of data are satellites. Uh, and we are very much leaders as Europeans through the European Space Agency in the world when it comes to um, Earth observation. But we also strive for, for knowledge and just that beauty and that uh, uh, pleasure that comes from, from discovery. Uh, we peer into the, the universe, we explore our solar system, and uh, some of you might know, tomorrow, if all goes well, we will be launching Bepi Colombo, which will go all the way to Mercury, uh, you know, the, the closest planet to the, solar, so to our, uh, to the sun. So very, very challenging uh, environment. And if all goes well, in, uh, in seven years, uh, right about that time, then Bepi Colombo will be orbiting around Mercury. So I think in the early morning tomorrow, you, uh, if you're interested, I hope you are, you will be able to follow live the, uh, the launch. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, human spaceflight. That's what I am part of. Uh, I, you know, I'm always <laughs> surprised every day, but, the, but this amazing opportunity I, uh, I have. We have the International Space Station, amazing example of, uh, of international cooperation, of successful international cooperation in space now for uh, almost uh, two decades. Uh, and we're looking beyond. It was uh, mentioned today. We're looking uh, at, the, uh, at the future steps to go um, again after the Apollo missions, which are already quite uh, far back in the past, to go again beyond our, our, our low Earth orbit, so our orbit close to our planet, uh, towards the moon, and then, of course, uh, paving the way for, for future missions to Mars. So I will conclude with that. I don't want to take more of your time. I, I will just add, uh, I guess, uh, one thing. I understand today is the Dies Natalis, so happy birthday, Phew! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cristoforetti. Uh, may I now ask the Beadle to escort uh, uh, Professor Gori Giorgi and Professor Iannuzzi uh, to the, uh, back to their seats. Uh, Dr. Cristoforetti, please stay here. Uh, we have also another little surprise for you, and that is we have uh, asked renowned uh, science journalist Govert Schilling to, to do a little interview with uh, our, our, our freshly minted uh, honorary uh, doctor and two of our students, Linda Vestra and Pauline Weiss. May I invite uh, Govert Schilling and Linda and Pauline to come up to the stage as well? This is ground control to Major Tom. Dr. 
Dr. Cristoforetti, congratulations with your honorary thank doctorate you, thank you. on this uh, eminent uh, university. Uh, you can sit down. I need to sit down. I have a leg uh, bless you, uh, seizure, so I, I can't stand for a long time. Apologies for that. Um, your mission was called Futura, the future. And I realize you are uh, one of the only 600 or so human beings that have made a space flight. Now, looking at the future, uh, many science fiction writers, maybe you were a science fiction fan in your youth, many science fiction writers predicted a big future for human spaceflight. How do you look upon that? What, what influence, what impact can human spaceflight have on our society in, say, 50 or 60 years from now? Well, it's a, it's a difficult question, of course. I, I uh, subscribe to that uh, theory that it's really difficult to predict the future. Um, on the other hand, I would say the next, uh, you know, the, the development in the next 10, 15 years in the field of what we call access to space, so basically rockets, you know, launchers, rockets, um, are going to be very interesting and they're going to have a huge influence into the way space exploration and also the exploitation of the space environment will go in the future. Because what we are seeing now is a, is a minor revolution where uh, private companies have gotten into, or new private companies have gone into the business of, uh, of access uh, to space, of launchers, and they have really disrupted it um, by lowering the prices, introducing reusability, and now they're triggering this cascade by virtue of which also traditional players, uh, space agencies, uh, uh, more uh, legacy um, companies are really striving to, to do that. So there's a lot of uh, energy uh, flowing into this uh, right now, lots of investment, and uh, it might be a game changer. You know, if access to space all of a sudden becomes 10 times cheaper or even more, then there's a lot more than that can be done uh, yeah. in space. Um, I, I also realized, talking to some, some of your astronaut colleagues, that one of the privileges an astronaut has is this, this view of the Earth and of humankind in its cosmic perspective, what, what people call the overview effect. Now, we have heard about uh, the theme of this, this meeting is uh, uh, a giant leap in communication. With, with all the uh, developments in uh, uh, communication technology, like maybe augmented reality and things like that, do you think that the effect of the overview effect can in the future be transferred to our simple people down here on Earth who do not have the privilege to make this space flight? I would argue that it has been already and, and, and already quite some time ago. I think the game changer was with the Apollo missions and the first uh, um, pictures of, uh, of, of the planet hanging there in space. And I think that that was a big contributor in triggering also the um, environmental um, revolution and a completely new mindset. I think what happens to astronauts in space, and not so much that you see a view that, you know, it's amazing and it's stunning and it's very beautiful, but it's not something unexpected, you know, and nowadays we, we see so many pictures from the space station. By the way, there is this movie that we actually shot up on space station. It's an IMAX movie, and I think it runs here in Amsterdam at the Science Museum. It's called The Beautiful Planet. Stunning images, you know, if you, if you want to see what the way we really see it from, from up so there, I highly recommend it. That's but almost the, like the real thing then? I, I think I think, it, I think it is in, in terms of the, the ecstatic experience. Now, here's the difference. You, when you are in space, it's not so much about what you see, but your mental state and the situation in which you are. I think it's such an intense experience. And it's made more intense by all the history. You know, you just, you wouldn't just teleport it in space from a, you know, it's like, hey, why don't you go and take a ride in space? It's not like that. You know, it's your dream. You work towards it. And then you finally are there. So you, you're in a different state of mind, which, which gives some kind of, I would say an, uh, um, a sensitivity, which 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 is which makes you open for for what uh, the environment tells you. But that we can find on on Earth as well, right? You don't have to go to space. I think we need to find ways of uh, experiencing that on Earth as well. Maybe detaching ourselves a little bit of of, of, of all the crazy pace that we're all obliged to um, to live by yeah. nowadays. Now, we do have two uh, free university students here. Uh, they are uh, students in uh, human movement uh, science, and they spend an inter internship in the European Astronaut Center in Cologne. And uh, the next two questions will be uh, addressed to you from uh, first by uh, Pauline Weiss. Um, thank you. 
Uh, well, as a student human movement scientist, I'm of course interested in physical health and fitness. So I was wondering what's the long, uh, what the effects have been of your long duration space flight on your physical health and fitness. And also how onboard training helped you to uh, recover once you got back on Earth. Yes. Thank you, Paulina. Um, I think we have excellent uh, what we call countermeasures on the space station now. We have uh, exercise equipment that really allows us to uh, stay in shape. Stay in shape means uh, not losing uh, muscle and also not losing bone, you know, because exercising actually helps you to keep your bone mass as well by virtue of the triggers that you send to your bone tissue. Um, we lose a little bit of uh, muscle in the postural muscles. But I think coming back, the feeling that I had more was to have lost uh, flexibility, that my muscles got a little bit shorter, um, some kind of elasticity in my joints uh, that uh, took quite some time to, uh, to come back, I, I would say. But, you know, I think, I mean, I'm getting older, so I'm sure I didn't get back to the, <laughs> to the, <laughs> to the shape I was before, but uh, almost. <laughs> okay, and the next question is by uh, Linda Vester. Um, my question is about the contact you had with your family and friends because you've been a long time away from home and what were your experiences with, with being away and uh, were you homesick or, and how was it uh, to be uh, back home and yeah. Thank you, Linda. Um, I, I didn't feel that detached. Uh, we're actually quite uh, fortunate because we have opportunities to talk regularly with, uh, with our friends and family, uh, with family even uh, like uh, almost like a Skype call. <laughs> we're that connected once, uh, once a week. Uh, they set that up for us so we can actually see each other, not only talk. And talking you could do on a daily basis. So it, it's not really uh, that uh, there being a problem. There's professions on, on Earth which leads you to much more isolation. You know, if you think about, for example, uh, military people deployed uh, overseas, uh, I think that's, uh, that's a lot tougher in terms of not being able to communicate. Thanks very much, Pauline and uh, Linda. Um, Dr. Cristoforetti, I, I was about to say Samantha. I'm sorry about that. Dr. Cristoforetti, um, we have a lot of acceleration in the development of robotics and uh, artificial intelligence. Do you think this will mean that the job of an astronaut carrying out science experiments in space will someday become obsolete? I mean, it might well be. I mean, I'm not saying uh, that it won't. Uh, the question is really, to me at least, is about uh, the nature of space exploration itself. I mean, not so much can we give a certain job to a robot uh, um, or not. I mean, I'm sure that we will be able to give more and more jobs to robots and uh, they will be able to do more and more jobs better than, uh, than we do. Now, the question is, uh, the experience of exploring and of living in space and, uh, you know, potentially in, for longer periods in the future, potentially with a much uh, wider population that has access, whether we are still interested in, in that as a, as a human experience. I think nowadays we, we definitely still have that, uh, that idea that the experience, you know, that the human experience kind of has to go through a human. It might not be you, but it needs to be a fellow human. But I don't know, maybe, you know, in two generations down the line, five generations down the line, they will have a different understanding of what experience is, and it will be through augmented reality or a remote presence, you know, that, that's very hard to say, but it's quite possible. I see, interesting. Now, probably in the, in the future there will be lots and lots more uh, astronauts, uh, partly due to space tourism. Now, I assume, this is actually a question from Pauline, I assume uh, that uh, you have had a very extensive training for your uh, mission, but in the future many people will go into space without such an extensive training. What's your view upon that development? Well, I, I think it's a little bit like uh, airplanes, right? You know, if you, you can be uh, part of the crew on an airplane, you can be the pilot, the co-pilot, the, the cabin attendant team, or you can be at the passenger, like the paying customers and uh, the paying customer. So um, I don't think that we will get any time soon to the point where you can go to space without any training at all. Uh, I'm sure that also those uh, paying uh, customers, tourists, we will have to get a measure of training. But I also think that they will be accompanied by professional, um, let's call them astronauts, <laughs> or maybe there will be a new word, I don't know, who have much more extensive training to be able to operate the systems and deal with, uh, with an emergency. Uh, one other thing that's, uh, uh, that struck me is, 
As a female engineer and jet pilot and astronaut, you're still part of a minority, unfortunately, being a woman. Now, in the Netherlands, as we all know, the percentage of women who are active in science, technology, engineering and math is, is very, very low, disappointingly low, much lower than in many other European countries like Italy, for instance. What would you suggest we could do in the Netherlands to, uh, to change that? Well, I, I really think I would defer the question to experts. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's people who study, uh, you know, there's a gender studies department and, uh, you know, that, that study those kinds of, of policies. Uh, it's one of the things where we all think that we know something about it just because, you know, we're all either male or female, most of us. And uh, I mean, we, just by virtue of that, we think that we have something to say on the topic. But, but I, I really think there's research on those topics. I mean, there's, there's people who study that, that probably have some attempts of answers. And so maybe we should just try not to pollute too much the conversation with just uh, opinions which are not based on any kind of expertise. So I try not to give that answer. Mm -hmm. I see. <laughs> Thanks very much. Now, maybe this is also uh, a, a part of the answer of my, my last question, uh, because now that you have received this honorary doctorate here at the Free University, um, how do you plan to, to make use of that in getting your message across? Well, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm an astronaut, so I'm in a very privileged position that part of my job is really to serve as an ambassador, uh, strictly speaking, of course, for space and the European Space Agency, but we tend to see it very broadly and, and be ambassadors for, for science and, uh, and technology and, uh, and education. So, of course, I, I will welcome uh, all kinds of opportunities to, to cooperate with, uh, with the university on, on that mission that, as I said, we have by my mandate uh, uh, in the European Space Agency. Um, yep. Okay, thanks very much for your uh, you. uh, answers in this uh, interview. Thank you and congratulations again. Thanks again. Thank you too. Thank you very much for these insights. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are almost at the end of this festive occasion. And not only has this been about connected worlds and about a giant leap in communication or other types of giant leaps, you've also heard the word perspective coming along many times. And we have seen many different perspectives today. We've seen the perspective of the perspective web. We have seen the perspective of hope blooming in a dance amidst the destruction of war. We have seen the absolutely amazingly unique perspective of looking at the earth from Space, how cool is that? <laughs> there are a very, very few people who have had the privilege of looking at our planet from this perspective. And one of them, ladies and gentlemen, is sitting with us today. This is amazing. Thank you very much, Peak for your insights into how we deal with not just the information age, but the communication deluge that we are faced by. Thank you, Dr. Cristoforetti, for your, what I thought was a remarkably honest answer about saying, you know what, that's not my expertise. I'm not gonna say anything about it. <laughs> More of us should do this. <laughs> Thank you, Govert, for trying. <laughs> I think you noticed that I was, I was visibly touched by the, uh, the dance performance, uh, and I think many of you were also. Let us celebrate and be thankful for what we have. 
let us celebrate our birthday. I invite you to join us in the foyer to raise a toast to our very own Freie Universiteit Amsterdam and to our new honorary doctor. And let me now switch to Dutch so that we can formally bring this academic session to a close. Op dat ik deze bijeenkomst kan sluiten met het uitspreken van de lofverheffing, verzoek ik u allen op te staan. Please rise. De naam van de Heer zij geprezen van nu aan tot in de overheid.